One of the most common pieces of advice you'll hear when it comes to building and configuring a gaming PC is that as long as you make sure to enable your XMP profile in your BIOS, you should be good to go. While that's not wrong and will suffice for most users, I'm here to tell you that you could be leaving a significant amount of performance on the table. Let's discuss that in this video. Hey, if you enjoy content like this, drop a like, make sure to subscribe, and smash that bell so you never miss another video. Hey, what is going on guys? Danny here. Welcome back to the channel and I hope you've all been doing well. This is a video that I've had the desire to make for a while now and it's going to be surrounding memory overclocking and tuning. I believe after seeing this video, if you're someone who just enables your XMP profile and leaves it at that, you'll probably be a bit more incentivized to go into your motherboard's BIOS and play around with more settings related to memory overclocking. When it comes to your gaming PC, there are three components in your system that for the most part are responsible responsible for how it will perform. Those components are your CPU, GPU, and RAM. Out of those three, the GPU is the component that gets the most focus because it will have the greatest impact on your system's performance, especially if you're playing at higher resolutions. When it comes to overclocking, the GPU is also by far the easiest. With Nvidia GPUs, you simply dial in an offset in MSI Afterburner and call it a day. With CPUs, it's essentially the same scenario, but there are some other factors that come into play, like if your workload involves a lot of multi-threaded tasks, workstation applications, then you'll be wanting a CPU with lots of cores, but for gaming, fast single core performance is the priority. Overclocking Intel CPUs is straightforward. You dial in a multiplier ratio in the BIOS, find the voltage that it will run stable at through some stress testing, and that's basically it in a nutshell. Now moving on to memory, I feel like this is the component that seems to get the least amount of attention, and I personally feel like it's just as important as the other components in your system. I think the reason why it probably doesn't get as much attention is because when it comes to memory overclocking and tuning, things can get quite complicated real fast. I don't even consider myself to be an expert on the matter either. I'd say I'm still just an intermediate user who's learning new things every day. The go-to configuration when it comes to memory for the vast majority of users is in enabling the XMP profile in the BIOS and leaving it at that. That's still miles better than the users who don't even dare to touch the BIOS and or forget to enable their XMP profiles. If you're not at least running your XMP profile, then you're straight up just throwing money in the trash at that point. With that said, the XMP profile is what I consider to be the bare minimum of where you should be running the memory kit at. You can actually overclock and tune your RAM to go beyond where the XMP profile sets it at with respect to clock speed and timings. This can result in some pretty significant performance gains, at least with some of the titles that I've tested, which we'll take a look at later on in this video. Though, as I mentioned earlier, it's more complex because there are just so many timings and other variables you have to test, which is why most people don't bother with it and just take the easy route, which is letting the XMP profile do the work for you. Which is okay, the XMP profile will get the job done for most people, and if you're satisfied with that performance, then hey, that's all that matters at the end of the day. The XMP profile is a good solution for those that just want a set it and forget it solution. For some reason though, when I bring up the topic of RAM tuning, People seem to get a bit defensive about it and need to justify why the XMP is the end-all be-all, which I just don't get. It might be fine for you if you're not an enthusiast and you're just a regular PC gamer, but for those looking to extract more performance, you should definitely hop into the BIOS and start tweaking. You shouldn't limit yourself and not try just because the vast majority aren't doing it. You spent all this money on your hardware and it might be in your best interest to get the most out of it. I personally look at things differently, I enjoy the aspect of overclocking and tuning. In fact, I'd say I've probably spent more time benchmarking and testing games lately rather than actually playing them. I'm also of the mindset where if it's a product or a service, I'll try to do whatever is practical to get the most out of the component without exotic cooling solutions and also to get the most out of my dollar and who doesn't like to get their money's worth. Another major reason as to why I personally prefer and suggest doing a manual RAM tune is because when it comes to a standard XMP profile, some motherboards I've noticed will load up some terrible timings aside from the primary timings. This can actually hurt performance, whereas just taking some time to do a bit of reading along with trial and error, you can tighten those timings, which will result in a positive impact to your performance. Some motherboards will also set or put you into Gear 2 if you're using a DDR4 kit with Intel, whereas Gear 1 would have worked perfectly fine. Similarly, on an AMD system, some motherboards by default will choose to 
run the Infinity Fabric at half the speed instead of equalizing it with a controller clock. This can severely hurt system latency. These are all settings that I think a lot of people just don't pay attention to when they decide that XMP is all that they need. I bring this up because what I've noticed while looking at benchmark numbers from other reviewers or sites in the past is sometimes I'll see numbers which just seem a bit off or low to me. Some will state that they're just using the XMP profiles for the test systems, which will make me go, okay, that makes sense then. This was something I noticed a lot when running a Ryzen system. I'd see people using XMP profiles, running timings like 16, 18, 18, 38, and who knows if they were even using a 1 to 1 ratio for the FCLK, when really they could have just brought those numbers down a bit, made sure to equalize those settings, and it would have really made a big impact on their system. Taking all of that into account, I figured that's enough of a background on this topic to indicate where I'm headed with this. So what I decided to do was that I took my DDR5 Patriot Viper Venom kit. This is a kit that's rated to run at 6000 mega transfers C36 using Hynix MDI chips and I'm using it on my 13700K test system. I loaded up the default XMP profile, didn't bother touching anything else, and I benchmarked 22 games at 1080p using my RTX 4090. After that, what I did was I went back into the BIOS, overclocked the RAM frequency and tightened some timings, then reran all the benchmarks. For those of you interested in the full system specs, I'll have all of those details posted in the video description. Before we get into the gaming benchmarks, I wanted to share some numbers I obtained using Ida64's cache and memory benchmark tool. What you mainly want to be looking at here is the memory line, and more specifically the memory latency. With our stock XMP profile, this kit attained a latency rating of 60 3.7 nanoseconds. While that isn't terrible, it's also not really good. Using MSI Dragon Ball, you guys can see the default timings that the Z790 Carbon Wi-Fi configured when I had enabled XMP. They're not terrible, I've actually seen some boards load up the TRFC at like 7 or 800, which is just abysmal. Here it's been set at 480, TWR is at 90, which is high, so that's something that can be brought down. TCKE is at 23, which is another timing which can be reduced, and some others. After spending some time in the BIOS and doing memory stress testing, this is what I had settled for. I managed to bump up the RAM frequency to 6800 mega transfers, which is a 13% boost, and also brought down various other timings. An important thing to note here is that this wasn't something I obtained using days and days of testing. This was just something I did in a few hours, and if I wasn't so time limited, I probably could have taken things a bit further. Along with that, I don't tweak every single setting because that would just take forever. Like I said, I'm not an expert on the subject, so there are some other timings I could have tightened to further optimize performance. When we go back and run the cache and memory benchmark tool, we not only see a boost, a significant boost in memory bandwidth, but we also see a drastic drop in memory latency, nearly 20% which will play a role in our gaming benchmarks. So speaking of gaming benchmarks, let's move on and jump into these titles. Please note for my testing, I decided to stick with 1080p, and even though I benchmarked 22 games, we won't be going over all of them just to save some time here, but we will take a look at the differences collectively once we've gone over 12 games. Taking a look at our first game, which is Final Fantasy XIV and Walker Benchmark, here we can see our tuned manual configuration provided us with a 9% uplift for our average FPS, but also a 10% improvement for the 1% lows. Most of my focus will be on the 1% lows this time because for all the titles, you'll notice that the average FPS figures are already so high. So at that point, what would be contributing to a smoother experience would be the consistency with frame times. The next game I wanted to take a look at was Total War Warhammer 3. And this game is really interesting because while our average FPS doesn't change by much, it's our 1% lows which have a staggering 71% improvement. If you guys recall when I did my 13700K vs 5800X retest, I noticed that the 1% lows on the 5800X were better, and at that time I thought it was because the Windows Store version of Warhammer did not have the P-Course fix applied to it, where perhaps it was utilizing E-Cores instead of the P-Course. But it's because the RAM configuration I was using just wasn't properly optimized, and the stuttering was very noticeable, just awful, and definitely was not as smooth as the average FPS would imply. However, you can see with the RAM properly tuned, those poor 1% low figures have been alleviated. So I'm glad I was able to solve that issue, turns out this game is quite latency sensitive. Moving on, and we have Forza Horizon 5, and I wanted to show this result to you guys because there are some games out there that show us results like these, which would make the RAM overclocking and tuning seem pointless because we didn't gain anything worthwhile. This game benefits more from a faster GPU and then a faster CPU, but seems like it doesn't really care too much about the faster RAM. 
F1 2022, on the other hand, is a racing game which does benefit from a manually tuned RAM config. While both configs offer stupidly high average FPS figures, we still see a 9% difference. And with the 1% lows, we do actually see a larger jump at 11%, which I think is what will make it more noticeable in terms of the differences with the smoothness. Horizon Zero Dawn is next, and here what we notice is that average FPS doesn't go up by a lot, which is fine because we're already pushing north of 200 FPS, but when it comes to our 1% lows, we see an increase of 11%. Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord shows us the same thing. Average FPS doesn't really increase by much, but... Anyhow, the 1% lows go up by a 10% margin. Up next, and we have Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 2022. And this is another title which shows us some eye-opening results. Again, average FPS for the stock XMP profile was fine, but where we do see a large jump is with our 1% lows. A whopping 29% improvement. This is one of those games too where the player would want the most consistent and smooth experience considering it's an esports competitive title. The Witcher 3 is next and this game has always been known to scale pretty well with RAM. Here we can see our average FPS improved by 14% while our 1% lows see an even larger 43% increase and that did help alleviate the stuttering I was noticing with this title. And what's interesting to note here is ever since they did the update for The Witcher 3, the next gen update that is, you can go on places like Reddit or other hardware forums and see people complaining about the stuttering and saying how they never really had this issue before the update. Um, it's probably poor optimization, but like I said, you know, if you tune your RAM, you can see performance increases like this and help alleviate that poor optimization this way. Rainbow Six Extraction is another title that doesn't show us a large improvement for the average FPS. At that point, who cares though? You're like, you're pushing over 400 FPS. But 1% lows increase by a 21% margin. I think this is the reason why I see a lot of people who believe XMP is just fine for their needs because they get so fixated on overall average FPS. But don't bother to check 1% lows or frame time consistency, then believe they're getting optimal performance. The next few titles we'll go through quickly because I'm sure you guys get the point by now. Assassin's Creed Valhalla shows us a 10% improvement for the 1% lows. In Far Cry 6, which is a very CPU bound title, there is a 16% improvement. And Watch Dogs Legion shows a 17% improvement. I've actually noticed that Ubisoft titles in particular seem to love the lower latency RAM. In our 22 game average, when it comes to the overall average FPS, the improvement doesn't seem large. A 12 FPS increase or around 5%. People will look at that and go, that doesn't seem like a lot. And it's why many seem so satisfied with just setting an XMP profile. The 1% lows, however, shows us a larger 12% improvement. And this is what matters more, it's consistency. You can run a game where you're pushing over like 200 FPS average, but if the frame times are all over the place, it's not gonna feel that smooth and responsive to you. Circling back to the average FPS, and we can see that there are a handful of games out there that showed around a 10% improvement, if not more, with the tuned RAM. Ignoring the differences with the 1% lows, that alone would be enough for me to justify just spending some time to tune my RAM. Like I said, I'm someone who wants to get the most out of my dollar, so that's worth it to me. Along with that, think about it this way. If you overclock your GPU, that gives you another 5-10% to improvement. You overclock your CPU, that will give you another 5-10%, to and that it starts to add up. So if you add the memory overclock on top of that, you have a system that's going to be performing way better than it was out of the box or just setting XMP. Furthermore, 1% lows also play a huge role in regards to offering the user with a smoother experience. We can see that about half the games showed around a 10% plus improvement, and like I said, this is the area where I feel like people are acting ignorant towards because they go on a site like Tech Power Up, for example, and this is a hardware site I like to read for my reviews too. They actually do memory testing as well, but in their results, they focus on average FPS and they don't discuss 1% lows. So someone looking at these results will go, it doesn't seem like it's worth the hassle to tune, but then they're missing out on half the story. Take my result from Control. The average FPS didn't even go up by a percent. Why? Because that game has a cap at 240 FPS. Again, someone will look at that and go, that's terrible, I don't care about that. But then when it comes to 1% lows, we actually see an 8% increase, which does result in smoother gameplay. It's not about average FPS, so to me, I'd say it's definitely worth it. One of the other arguments I hear is that testing with XMP is fine because that is representative of what the masses are going to be doing. Again, if you're satisfied with that performance, then hey, you're good to go. But why are you worrying about what other people are settling with? If someone else wants to be lazy and they don't want to maximize their platform, that's their choice. 
But to write off the improvements tuned RAM can offer because not everyone does it is just dumb in my opinion. To that point, I understand that when it comes to RAM tuning and overclocking in general, it's a your mileage may vary sort of situation because how far you can overclock that component will depend on a lot of factors, such as the quality of the silicon, silicon lottery, how much voltage you need, cooling, power, and more. You might end up with a kit of RAM that is only good as what the XMP profile will allow it to do, or you could luck out and have a kit that can offer you much better performance at a significantly lower cost. This kit that I'm using here currently retails for about $227 Canadian. It was actually a little bit more when I bought it because that was when DDR5 pricing was high. And right now I did a quick search for other kits on Amazon that were configured similarly to what I got for my overclock settings and found they cost significantly more, nearly twice as much in some cases. So I ended up paying significantly less for RAM that performs just as well as those kits because I took a few uh, hours out of my day and decided to tune. The thing is, you won't actually know for sure until you actually try. Now, if you're someone who really just doesn't care about RAM tuning, you don't have the time, you want what's the best out of the box configuration, you're much better off going with AMD's X3D CPUs. With the large amount of cache these CPUs offer, they really help mitigate the latency issue Ryzen has, so you could pair some cheap DDR5 RAM, just enable XMP, and you're good to go. And that's all right too, I get it. Not everyone has the time to just sit around for hours and you know look at all those various timings and play around with voltages. So if you're in that camp, this is the route you probably want to take. All in all, I had fun making this video. I find a lot of this stuff to be pretty intriguing. Just seeing the impacts and benefits of RAM tuning makes me more excited to try out other configurations in the future. I'll definitely be making some follow-up videos similar to this one. I'm going to be seeing if I can get my hands on an ADI kit. Right now, they're just really expensive here in Canada, so your support for the channel is definitely appreciated. If you guys are interested in picking up the DDR5 kit I used for this video, however, I'll have a link to it in the video description, as well as any of the other products I mentioned or featured. That'll do it for this one, guys. Take care. If you guys found this video to be informative and entertaining, then leave a like. Let me know your thoughts and comments down below. Be sure to check out the video description for cool links and ways to support the channel, such as using my Amazon affiliate link. And if you're interested in seeing more content like this, then consider subscribing, I'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for watching, take care and I'll see you in the next one.